Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Carlson Cards Podcast. Now, today's guest should be a familiar face for many of you, hopefully. If not, you're going to meet Iowa Dave today. And Iowa Dave is a great guy for a lot of reasons. He's a very knowledgeable collector, very passionate, also enjoys making content in this space. And one of the topics we're going to talk about here today a little bit is not only his collecting journey, but also how he stays motivated with collecting through the years. I know something I've been feeling lately, and you'll probably see from the title of this video, it's a little bit of hobby burnout, a little bit of like, don't know what to do. I'm just not having as much fun in certain areas as I always have been. And, you know, kind of trying to deal with that. And maybe that resonates with some of you. So I think it'll be a good topic to talk about here with Dave. Also keep it to the cards too. We'll have some fun talking about some awesome cards. So Dave, I appreciate you hopping on. How is everything going? It's going great, Austin. I'm really happy to be here. I, I love your podcast and thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. So for those of you that uh, do not know you, Dave, um, I was wondering if you could maybe just give a brief personal overview, maybe what you do. Um, and then tie that to the hobby a little bit, kind of maybe your introduction to cards and that sort of thing. Maybe what got you first started, what's kept you around, um, anything you want to fill in there for those who don't really know about you yet. Absolutely. So I collect, like, like so many others, I collected as a kid. I collected from about age nine to 16. And it was more than just collecting the cards. I love the cards. I love the stats on the back. And I loved putting sets together, prospecting in my own way as a kid, right? But it was also, it was a social activity and you know, my friends and I, we'd get on our bikes and we'd ride to 7-Eleven or, or the grocery store and we'd buy those cards as a kid. It was great. And then, you know, stopped around 16, got a car, got a job, did start doing other things and then got back into it like everyone else did right, right around 2020. Uh, I went home. I had heard cards started to be worth something again. And so I went down to my dad's place down in St. Louis, which is where I'm from, St. Louis, born and raised to get my cards. You know, he was down there. It was COVID was happening and took the family down to see him. He, he lives by himself. We thought, let's go, let's go visit, keep him some company. We masked up and down we went. And my parents never, ever got rid of my cards, never moved them. So in my old childhood bedroom, which is now his office, the right side of the closet was still my cards organized the way I had them as a kid in the boxes, labeled top loaders, binders, everything else. So it was really, really easy to move. And started selling them off and was making some pretty good money, um, paying for groceries, you know, maybe some parts of a mortgage, that kind of stuff we were paying with. And uh, got some graded. And by pure dumb luck, I got it in right before the the, the stoppage happened. And right, so I be, right, after, right before I did then. I waited 16 months. You waited probably a few months then or something? Yeah, that was it. Right, yeah, yep. that, that was it. So I sent about 15 cards or so off for grading and, and got them back in a re completely reasonable time. And... Uh, and and uh, sold most of those off as well. Um, some I kind of wish I had had more knowledge of. I probably could have gotten more of, for sure. Um, but I held on to I had I had a uh, basically one left, and it was a 1991 Upper Deck uh, Michael Jordan uh, number one, and it was him in the baseball uniform with the White Sox. And this was still you know three years, two three years before he be, actually went and played baseball. But I got a ten on it, a PSA ten which I didn't know how big of a deal that was going to be at the time. PSA 10, Michael Jordan. I just thought, oh, great, 10. Why are all my cards 10? Um, and I put it on eBay and it's put it on auction for seven days and it sold for about $800. Like, you know, this is a base card. Um, and so I started to get into it and all my research to sell it, I actually became interested in cards again. And so I said to my wife, you might have to hang on to this one and just use it for some playing around money for the hobby. And she was sure, go for it. And that's how I got back in. And so I, with that money I had from the Jordan card, I went and bought the card that would get me rich, which was a, um, an Anthony Edwards base prism rookie raw. And I was off and running again. That's how I got back into the hobby. Um, but since then I've migrated mostly back to baseball. Uh, that's sort of what my thing is. I collect baseball cards and um, some basketball for University of Iowa uh, players who who go to the pros, but otherwise it's it's mostly just baseball is what I collect. And then I started a podcast in uh, spring of twenty three called the Shallow End, and it's just I did that mostly just to uh, just to meet people and kind of reach out a little bit. Um, I was very much just consuming other people's cards, but I also wanted just to reach out and say hi and meet people. I, I think that as people get older, they tend to isolate. A lot and just kind of get into their own little routines and ruts and i really felt myself doing that and so i 
did the podcast just as a way to start putting myself out there to say hi and not become such an isolated person. I love that inspiration there. And it's so true. And that's, you know, part of the reason I've enjoyed this is getting people on, especially who maybe haven't been on a podcast or that sort of thing, like yourself with your podcast, it's like, it becomes a gem out of the blue, right? You probably like your point, maybe didn't expect a lot. And then you start it. And then I'm sure for yourself, I mean, I've noticed you get a lot of traction. People are very interested in your podcast. And I think I've noticed that too, again, like I was getting out with interviewing people where it's just cool. All these people who are out there, we're all nerds. We maybe don't talk about our cards as much as we'd like to in our personal life. It's a great escape. And then you never know who you're going to meet or who's going to be a great, you know, story to listen to or something to just, you know, get you by on your drive to Monday work while you don't want to (laughs) be driving to work on that sort of thing. But uh, I just want to comment on something there. I'm going to ask a question there, Dave. So um, I also, I appreciate the background knowledge. I think I know bits of pieces, but it's great to hear it, you know, kind of all at once again. Um, so when you got back in, you know, you're going back to your childhood home, going through the cards. Um, I guess that inspiration there, it sounded like kind of the same for, I, I would say myself, where I remember the childhood, like Pokemon cards ever, right? And my first thought is, what are they worth? I'll just sell them to get rid of because they haven't been a part of my life for so yeah. long. Is that kind of what drove that? Where you just kind of like, you know, minimalism, I have these, you know, they're worth money now, I'll go sell them and then move on with my life. But then it sounds like you kind of fell in love along the way. Is that kind of what happened? That was exactly what happened, Austin, where I got the cards. I thought I was just going to sell them off. I thought I might hang on to a few, you know, just mm-hmm. for nostalgic reasons and a um, couple cards that belong to older members of my family who I, I didn't want to sell those off. Right. Just want to hang on to a few of them. But the more that I got into it and the more that I researched it, the more that I started to remember how much fun I had collecting before. But there was a lot of there are a lot of things I didn't know now. And I was really fascinated by the modern climate of collecting they were so shiny. I didn't know that cards could be so shiny, for example. Um, but even as I got back into it, it took me a while to learn. Uh, I, think, I think I've told the story offline before, but uh, I started buying packs again. And and uh, I, I bought, uh, it was Don Russ Optic Baseball. And I'd already been back in the hobby, I'd say four or five months at this part. But to tell you how, how I wasn't noticing things, um, I was on a work trip. And I brought just a couple packs to rip while I was in my hotel room that night. And I pull like a Bobby Witt rated rookie. Okay. And it wasn't until four months into my reintroduction to the hobby that I thought, wait, there's no logo on his helmet. <laughs> like what is happening? Right. And then, I, and then I did a quick Google search. It took me five seconds to realize there are unlicensed cards. There are licensed cards. What is a refractor? I didn't know any of the stuff that was going on. So it was a whole new world. So it was like it was beginning again and just being able to be curious and that there was so much content out there, where, you know, even cardboard connection or, you know, trading card database, all of those were just, it, it really helped me catch up like a tutor in a way. And it just became fascinating to me. And that's one thing that got me hooked. It wasn't just the value of the cards because at that point I'd already realized oh, this, some, so much of the stuff is out of my reach, but just the, the modern history, all the stuff that I had missed really piqued my curiosity. That's amazing. That totally makes sense. And uh, maybe something too with this story, another quick one that I came to mind. And you mentioned it, I think it's really a great story is the Jordan that you get a 10 on, you then sell and then you turn normally, like I'm sure you were thinking, like you said, groceries, we can whatever, but you said instead, let me use this to bankroll slash fund a collection of sorts or explore this a little more. And I think it's such an interesting concept because I bet you that's the case for a lot of us, like for myself, and I've never shared this on here. When I very first started, I actually heavily collected video games like before it was super popular. So I'd have pretty, and I swear here, a pretty bitchin uh, Sega Genesis collection, if that's familiar for anybody um, here. But I had a lot of like complete in box games, all that stuff. And when I got into the cards, I really jumped all in and I hadn't played any of these games or looked at them in, you know, a few years at that point after it took a while to find them. I would garage sale, buy them on eBay, look for good deals. Um, then I actually like similar to you, I took a lot of that money that I had saved up or had collected over the years and then put that in the cards. And I, I feel like it's an unwritten or unstated thing that there's probably a lot of us out there where you have that one random thing you had forever. You didn't think about it. And then that kind of, you know, funds your hobby experience at the beginning, at least a little bit. So I appreciate you sharing that. And it's, it's also probably a nice thing that you've got the ton on that when it, the market was like, it was like you said, a base card for like $800, it's just crazy. So much of it, like I said, it's, it's just dumb luck, right? Like mm-hmm. I didn't, you know, it, had I graded that card now, it might be worth, I don't know, three hundred dollars, two hundred and fifty, three hundred dollars. But so much, so much of it is luck. I mentioned the Anthony Edwards cards, and 
I sold my base prism cards like Darius Garland and others, which is the stuff I was collecting. Oh yeah. Because I got tired of them. I sold them and I went back and looked at car ladder like a month before the, the peak. And, and that wasn't skill. I, mm-hmm. it was just, I'm tired of these cards. And so I got rid of those and some first Bowman Chrome base cards during spring training, which I didn't know was the right time to sell them anyway. And so there is a lot of skill and research, I think, that goes into this. But sometimes you just have to get lucky. And I got very lucky. Oh, for sure. So, you know, we talked about your kind of origin back into cards. And then fast forward now, we're in 2024. And you released an episode that I would encourage everyone to listen to. It's probably um, one of personally one of my favorite podcast episodes, period, I've heard in the hobby. And you talked about pressing the reset button, I think is the title of that episode. If I took the note correctly, I was just making sure that's what the title was. Um, would you mind just briefly, very briefly sharing what that was, what happened? And do you have any learnings that you would be willing to share with the audience now at two and a half, three-ish months later? Like, do you regret what you did? Are you happy about it? What have you learned from this experience? I see a lot of facial reactions, so I'm excited to hear. <laughs> sure, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll start at the end, which is... Uh... Very, very happy I did it. And I'll kind of go back and briefly tell the story. I'm, I'm a baseball nut, but I'm also a bit of a sports history nerd. And so I always knew that I would want someday um, a 48, 49 leaf Jackie Robinson, which is Jackie Robinson's rookie card. I didn't think it was realistic. I didn't think there'd be any way. It, the, once I realized how badly I wanted it, it was already soaring at that point. And on the budget that I have for cards, I would likely have to save for, I think I figured out three to five years buying nothing else over that period to get it or maybe get rid of everything. That would have been a way of doing it as well. And it didn't seem realistic. And this would have been October of 22, I'm sorry, October of 23. Mm -hmm. When I first put out an episode talking about how, I think the episode was called, should I sell everything? And it got a lot, people were really interested in that and thought about the idea I kind of dropped it, didn't seem realistic. And then March or April, uh, my, it just something kicked in again. You know, I went on Dave Spinrad's show, the Rated Rabbi podcast, and he asked, he wanted to talk about the idea some more. And I started thinking maybe the idea was possible. But something happened earlier this year, January, February or so, where I stopped wanting to buy any cards of any value. Because what I felt was, is what's the point? What is the point to me that 48 leaf Jackie is the most important card of the most American important American athlete who has ever lived. And if I don't have that in my collection, what am I even doing? And so I still collected my small little Brian Jordan collection because those were cheap, but I almost subconsciously froze everything out because it felt like a huge waste of time. So to get to the end of the, the, the story between April and July with the national, I sold about 92% of, or traded 92% of my entire collection. I just got rid of it and I went for it. And I, and at national, I was there for about 35 to 40 minutes having walked in on that first day, which was Thursday for me. And I bought one and that was it. And I was down to, I could fit all my cards into my pocket at that point, all my slabs cards into my pocket. And so I moved my entire collection most of it anyway, for this Jackie Robinson rookie card. I was so happy that I did it. It was a lot of work, but I'm glad that I did. So you mentioned what kind of lessons that I learned is that for me, it was completely 100% worth it. I've been asked, would I do it again? And 100% because since I did that, I've discovered that everything sort of grows out of that one card that without that card, I was just like a kite up in, in, in a, in a derecho. Right. And, and it was like, now this looks good. Now this looks good. Now I'm going to grab this. But now I have some sort of focus and some sort of direction. And uh, I think meaning is probably too strong of a way of putting it necessarily. But to have this one card that uh, it, I feel like I was able to start again. And since then, no other card has even gotten into my head of now I have to go on to the next card. This card is here and I feel a sense of calmness and being content that I have it because this was what I suspected was the card that I needed. And it was verified by how I have felt since national back in July. So how important do you think for that experience? Was it the fact that you were so had so much conviction of this specific card? The reason I ask is I hear the concept a lot, you know, selling 
quantity to buy quality. You know, like I hear that stated a lot, but I feel like a lot of time it's driven not even as not necessarily by what you're saying of a I've dreamed about this card forever. I would want this one so bad. Like I feel like a lot of it's like you should sell these 30 to buy a card that's more expensive because it'll go up in value more. Like I feel like I hear that a lot. But what I'm getting at here is I I feel like that mindset or even a mindset of I think I want that expensive car, but I don't know for sure. I feel like that could lead to an example where somebody maybe does this and it doesn't work out. So I think my question to you is how important do you was it? And do you think for others maybe who are listening that if they want to try something like that, they have the conviction behind the card, if that makes sense. Like how much of it do you think was um, the fact that you thought it through for so long, you'd always wanted this versus just like an impulse doing it. Like, would you have done it differently if it was more on impulse or do you feel like it was important that it was so well thought out? That's a good question. I think everything I did up to that point was mostly impulse. I'm a, I'm largely an impatient person. You know what they say is measure twice and cut once. And I would cut once and then maybe I should measure. I go, I go the wrong way with it. And I think for me, being able to be patient on this and to think about it longitudinally in a way where over time, the thought wouldn't go away. Whereas I would have other ideas sometimes. Maybe I, I would think, oh, I need to have this card, but I didn't have the funds. And by the time I had the funds, I didn't want the card anymore. That was a sign that that was something impulsive. But you know, nine months passed, even longer to be honest, probably close to a year from when I started realizing how much I wanted this card. And then the thought went away and it came back and the thought went away and it came back. And that was some sort of verification, I think, that I needed that this was not impulsive. And then the other thing, which is what I mentioned before, is is my almost a fast that I went on of not buying anything else because it all felt like a waste because I knew that whatever I bought would just be sold or traded just so I could go back and get this card. And at some point it just became inevitable. Awesome. Totally makes sense. Thanks for the summary there. And I appreciate the recap and your thoughts now. Cause it was interesting again, listen, I'm like, I'm curious what he'll think three months from now. Cause I think he'll be happy because of again, how much conviction you had and all the work it took and the value you place on that specific player and card in terms of, you know, what you don't want to end your collecting with. And I think that's why it goes to show you how good it works when you think it through and your passion as a collector side of things. Um, so it is. And I, and I keep it, yeah, go ahead. I, you know, I don't keep, I keep it off site, right? I don't, I don't want to keep a car like this around the house. And the other day I saw it for the first time in a couple of weeks and I held it in my hand and just <sighs> looked at it inside. And it's just, it's just such a wonderful card. And I, I feel um, like my place in, in this hobby is uh, worthwhile mm -hmm. because of it. And it makes sense because I have the card. Yeah, that's amazing. And it's all the journey, right? Like you probably had to struggle. You had to bounce around. You had to do it before you got to this point. You had to buy the Darius Garland base cards before you got to this point. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Okay, so a question I was going to ask you and a topic again that the kind of the title of this video is a little bit of um, just maybe discussing your thoughts on like hobby burnout. Maybe if I, I would, I guess maybe start by saying what is your um, definition of what that is? And if you don't have one, maybe I can give what I feel like that is. And then um, just curious if you've experienced this yourself at all, again, in the past, recently, anything like that, and how, um, again, you've dealt with it, or, you know, how do I say, uh, journeyed back through the hobby and stayed in here and enjoying it without burning yourself out. Because I know, I guess, just for context myself, I, I don't, I'm not like obviously clinically like OCD, but I have those kind of tendencies where I'm a very obsessive compulsive person in everything that I do. And so I notice where I'm like all in for two weeks, then I need a break for a couple of days. I'm all in for a month then I need a break for a week. Like that's just who I am as a person. So I'm curious kind of what your thoughts are on this topic a little bit. Sure. And I'm not sure where to begin. This is such a big topic and I'm really excited to talk this through with you. I have experienced hobby burnout for sure. I, I've been there. And I think that the sort of the loose way I would define it would be when the hobby becomes a chore and when you feel like you have to do it instead of wanting to do it, but you can't get away from it and you almost have to force yourself to look at eBay or you have to force yourself to look at whatever fanatics is called at this point um, <laughs> rather than rather than wanting to do it. Mm -hmm. And, and you want to get away and you can't get away from it for whatever reason. I think that's sort of loosely how I think about burnout, but I, I've, I've been there for sure. What, what is it like for you? 
Yeah, I, I think that's a great way to put it. It's almost like where so I'm a person, actually, ironically, I don't have any personal social media at all. I cut that kind of in, in college, maybe three, four years ago. And I've, I haven't looked back, actually. I've been happy with that. Um, so I think for me, part of maybe where my tendencies go as well is it's almost like it becomes a chore to your point where I feel like I have to keep up my Instagram. I have to, you know, keep um, keep communicating the hobby. Or I'm going to lose my relationships. It's kind of for me a little bit. I get those rumblings of the thoughts I used to have with Facebook and Instagram, you know, like keeping all my family up to date. And it's like, I think part of my issue with it as well is um, a mindset thing. Like, I think I need to personally, I've noticed, need to keep the fun in it and remind myself that's why I'm here, like to your point, and not so much of needing to check box A, B, and C, go get this card, check eBay to make sure you didn't miss anything. Like, I think it, I have to come to terms a little more with the fact is this week, I'm not feeling like checking safe searches. I don't want it like you, to your point, go check this auction house, that auction house, this auction house, just to make sure my card didn't pop up because that's how, how the hobby is at this point. Um, and I think I need to come to terms with if this is not the week for that, if you lose the card, it's okay. Like it's okay. If you don't check Instagram, because I always think, what if somebody messaged me because something popped up 30 minutes ago and I'm going to miss it? Because that has happened. That has happened. I can name five or six cards that that's happened. Um, and it's like, I don't know. It's like coming to terms with that balance, especially as you know, life goes on. Like you said, I, I mean, we have one child. We're going to have more, I hope. Um, life's going to get busier. And it's like trying to balance that what I'm calling burnout, but also still enjoying the hobby because you don't want to go too far over that edge where you do make it, you know, too much work, too much checking the box instead of just going back and enjoying your cards you already own, talking to friends that you want to talk about, you know, talk with cards about and just the more bare bones stuff of the hobby that I feel like it's kind of underwritten. Um, I don't know. Does any of that resonate with you? That's kind of where my head's been lately. It does, especially when you use the term work. When it starts feeling like work, that's when you step away but I think there's another layer to it where you can't drive yourself or pull yourself to step away where, you know, you don't, maybe it's worth deleting eBay off your phone or, or getting rid of Instagram for a little while, but you can't because you're, you're stuck. And I was talking to someone just the other day and I'm going to change some of the details because I don't have permission necessarily to tell the story. So I'm going to protect who they the identity and whatnot. But I mean, I think so much sometimes is is we we wrap up our identity, who we are in our collection. Look how we name ourselves, right? I'm I'm Iowa Dave because I'm from <laughs> Iowa. I picked the name in five seconds. I wish I had done something different, right? But just think about what it's like if you've made friends in here and you've made a reputation, especially through social, where let's say your Instagram name is uh, Super Duper Ray Lewis Collector ninety nine, and so people know you as the Ray Lewis Collector. But then some fantastic Ray Lewis super fractor or gold prism pops up and you can't get it. And instead of you getting the card, you know, Ray Lewis newbie 100 gets the card. And then who are you anymore? Do you even exist in the hobby anymore? Because the identity you've built for yourself goes away. And that's, I think, why we see prices driving up because people need, they have to have these cards. Otherwise, why are they here? And it becomes obsessive. And then it becomes like work because if you don't get the card, then you're not the collector that you thought you were. So you have to plug in even more and it becomes a headache and it becomes stressful and it becomes anxious. And that's brutal. I mean, that that's, that's really terrible. So in a way you almost, it's almost good to lose a card, I think, right? because then you realize that somebody else is out there as well and you can't possibly have every card that you want anymore. But then, you know, are you still the super duper Ray Lewis collector? I don't know. It's so I think that's a big part of it is because we've just built up who we are in this hobby. And if we don't get it, then what? And getting back to the person that I spoke with, um, they didn't have the funds for this card that they needed. And their and their Instagram handle is based on a certain player who they collect and they couldn't get it. And they just didn't have the funds. Other things were taking over at that time. And someone bought the card out from under them. Like they thought maybe they could save up long enough, but then someone else bought it and they knew who got it. And then after they didn't get it, they felt relieved that they didn't get it. They, they, was, they realized they didn't want the card. They thought that they should have the card, but they didn't actually want the card. And then when they didn't actually get it, it didn't mean they didn't like Ray Lewis or whoever it was any less. They just didn't want the card. 
but it's hard to kind of know that spot in between. And yeah, it, it's, it's a challenge and I, I'm not a, I'm not a psychologist by any stretch, but I do feel like we, we become our collection in a way. And, um, somewhat if we if we don't keep up and keep curating it and keep adding to it in a way it's like we're doing ourselves a disservice yeah I, that resonates so that was a masterpiece very well explained there because that resonates so much with me and this is why i'm like dave is the guy to talk to about this i think it's a great topic um because i think it's emulated too in the way like i feel like for, i'm just using myself example to, to what you just said resonates so hard because a lot of the ways i would complain about the hobby right now is like you already said this Price is going so high. The set I've been able, not the select set, but other stuff I've been able to buy great prices for a couple of years. It's not the case anymore. I'm seeing this person buy it and then it's relisted for 10X the next day. And you know, all this stuff that I hear a lot of people say, which again, there's nothing wrong with any of this. It's just, I think when I'm thinking like that, or some of us are thinking like that, I think it ties to what you're saying where it goes back to, well, if I can't buy this anymore, well, crap, there goes my chance to add 10 new cards every month that I'm so excited about. And it's just like, at what point has it become, like you said, obsessive or like just built into your identity versus the fact is when I don't win it or I don't bid on it for once on something, it's so relieving. It feels so relieving, which is so silly. I don't know if you've been there, right? There's like a card that pops up that you know you want. It's so borderline. And you're like, uh, do I, don't I? And then you don't bid and it goes higher than you want it anyway. And you're like, I didn't even try. I'm, I'm good. I don't need this. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, yeah. I don't know. And it's just interesting because I think this will be a major, like at least for myself, I feel like this is going to be a major theme over the years and decades to come because, again, I truly love this. I feel like I want to keep it sustainable to where I'm always going to want to be collecting and growing my collection and doing it in a healthy way. And I feel like, again, that's where some of this gets very interesting because I have to conquer the, not demons in my head, right? But these like, you know, these little ants crawling around saying, bid on it, bid on it. You have to go buy it. If you don't get that one, you're not going to get another one. Even though I've known that, I, you know, that's not the case, right? We've all been here long enough to where you lose an out of 10 and then, you know, a month later you see two of them. I mean, it's just, it's not impossible to find cards. And I think the FOMO and all of that, I mean, I think it just adds up and boils down. And to your point too, about the not wanting to own cards, I've noticed lately, I just, because of the like, okay, I'm just going to, you know, continue doing the podcast. I love these conversations, buy cards kind of quietly, you know, just doing my thing. And then I post on Instagram the other day for the first time in a few weeks. And it's funny because it's like, I have a big stack of cards I've been buying that I haven't shared. And I know I like them because I haven't shared them and I still like them, if that makes sense. There's no sense of like looking for approval from somebody and saying, that's a cool purchase. Good for you. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> or this one only gets this many likes. Like, again, it's silly examples, but I think we all probably um, balance that. And I, again, like I mentioned, I say all this because I feel like it's important to talk about. And I feel like it's a general theme that I don't know, I'm going to be dealing with probably forever. It's like, how do you do this healthily and everything like that? So I don't I think know. We I are. Think yeah, I think we all deal with it. It's it's only natural, right? I, and I think there are questions that are worth asking ourselves, such as why do we feel relief or happiness when we don't get a card that we want? I think that's worth <laughs> probably because asking. we're overextending financially and we should be saving for our kids' college more or house or that. <laughs> like <laughs> the five things in my head right now. I mean, that's realistic. It's sorry, just to throw one point out there too, that I think emphasize what I just talked about. The trick with me as well is the fact that, like, and I don't know about yourself, but I know I've kept this very separate, which I'm not saying that's the case for everybody, but I know I have funds to buy cards. Like I need to, at some point I have to tell myself, it's okay to take some of this money and go use it elsewhere. Like that is okay. And I, I feel like I haven't gotten through that. There's still a lot of like, I don't know. It's like guilt of, but then I can't get this X card when this pops up and you know, that sort of thing. But anyways, just like throw a little more context into what I said. <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree. Right. What else could we be doing with these funds? But then, you know, at the same time, it, we need to do things that are extracurricular. It, it, we need to have hobbies as well, but it's a matter of when, what, what crosses the line. I, I think part of it too, is that it, it's cycle according to the calendar sometimes. Yeah. I know yeah. A hundred percent. I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. Like me personally, um, from about April, and I've noticed this the last two years in 23 and 24 from about April. That's sort of like when I start thinking about national till about a week after national. It's it's like, I am, you know, if you think about like the RPMs on a car, I'm on red, like I'm <laughs> going hard. Yes. Um, yep. And then about two weeks after it's like, I crash and I'm like, yep. this sucks. What am I doing? I don't want to be, I, don't, I, don't, I stop, I stop consuming content. Yep. I, I close eBay. I feel like there's nothing to work for anymore. What am I even doing here at this point? 
And it was last year. I didn't know how to pinpoint it. It was a really strange feeling, you know, I think because it was my first national. I didn't, but then this year I noticed it happening again. And I thought, okay, now we've got two points of reference here. And I'm starting to, you know, we can start coming up with a pattern that this is happening. Um, so this year I was able to take a deep breath and realize this is probably natural. It's, it's such a fun time going to the national, seeing friends, getting cards that you want. It is everything I could possibly want in a short little, like for me anyway, like guys vacation. And I enjoy it so much that when it's over, I'm just kind of sad because I know it's going to be another year um, until I build up to that. And I might go to a, a show once every four or five months to pop in. But it's not the same, you know, because at that point, I'm just kind of walking around on my own, just looking at things. Um, yeah, but I think that's I think I think part of it. And for other people, for NBA collectors, I imagine this is a great time of year. But come, you know, come the playoffs and your team is out and your players market has gone down 15 percent. You're like, I need a break. And I think that something that we could all think about more as well. Yeah, totally. Well, awesome. Thanks again. That was a fun discussion. I mean fun but also like serious but you know what i'm saying it's an important one it is it is because i don't know it's nice to hear your thoughts too and i think i even just took away a lot myself having the conversation with you so hopefully others listening get something out of this as well all right and so now for those of you that have never listened to the podcast which hopefully isn't too many of you um but if you're new welcome by the way as well uh we do something with our guests that is pretty unique where um put together a mount rushmore by the by themselves by the guest of their top four favorite cards in their collection kind of regardless of value regardless of anything like that just what do they feel is the four cards that most represent what they enjoy about collecting in their collection um so dave here obviously has a great mount rushmore as you can tell probably by the thumbnail of the video if you're on youtube or by the visual here you have period um so dave i'd love if you could kind of step through any of these four cards whichever one you want to start with and just as a reminder, I always say this, um, is that not everyone will have the visual. So if you could describe the card, whether that's a grade or the serial numbering or what the year is, that sort of thing, that anyone that could listen and not know the card knows what you're talking about, that'd be great. Absolutely. And just seeing this thumbnail up here gets me excited, even though they're my, they're my own cards. I can look at them whenever I, I want to. I think I saw a tear be shed. I don't know if that was actually real or not, but I it's, saw it's it. real. Okay, it's, yeah. it's real. I might need a moment. <laughs> so, uh, so the first one I'm talking about is the 1999 Willie McGee platinum medallion and it is serial numbered out of 99. And I'll take a moment to explain because not everyone maybe knows who Willie McGee is. Um, I grew up, as I mentioned, I'm born and raised in St. Louis and Willie McGee was my favorite player when I was growing up and, and uh, people who grew up when I did in St. Louis, the assumption is that you were an Ozzie Smith fan. He's the hall of famer. He's the, he's the legend, the highest defensive war of all time, all that stuff. But Willie was the one that kids loved. He didn't have a whole lot of cards. He was during the junk wax era. He was during the 80s. And by the time Topps Finest came out with that first refractor set in 1993, he had already moved on from St. Louis. And at that point, I think it was with the Giants. But then toward the end of his career, when he was older, he played about 18 years in the majors or so. He came back for a curtain call for his last two years with the Cardinals or so. It's lost two or three years. And that was late 90s, prime time for some really cool sets. He doesn't have any essential credentials, nothing like that, but he does have these platinum medallions. And so I waited for a couple of years. He's got a 98 and he's got a 99. And for a, and in this picture, uh, he is playing the outfield. He was a gold glover. If you don't know him, he has about 2,200 career hits. He was a National League MVP. He's won a World Series. He had a really good career, just not a Hall of Fame one. Um, but I looked for a couple of years for either the 98 or hopefully the 99 one because I like the image a lot more. In the 98 one, he's swinging. He's got a, a really strained look on his face. And I couldn't find one. And one time one popped up and I missed it because I just didn't have my save searches right. But they come up maybe once a year, once uh, maybe once every nine months or so. And then um, within two weeks of each other, they both came up, 98 and 99. And I got the 98 first. And it was from a seller in Canada. I don't know how he, at first I didn't know how he got it. But I bought it, and of course, it goes through customs. It gets hung up in customs, and I, and I want it by auction. And it wasn't a whole lot of money. And then a week later, the other one pops up, the one that I'm showing that you're showing here, the 99. And I was like, this is the one I really wanted. This is the one that shows Willie as I remember him. And it was the same seller up in Canada. I'm like, what is going on? And so I messaged him, 
Um, and I said, I'm going to be bidding on this. Do you have any others? Because we could save a lot of problem, a lot of time. I could just buy them all from you. And he goes, no, I just bought them from some collector. Somebody walked in with all these platinum medallions. It was like, and they had like Ricky Henderson and all these stars. And Willie McGee was one of them. And so that's the first one. And so it took me a couple of years to find it. And then it turned out that some collector in Canada had one. And uh, it took them being tired of it. And then some dealer putting it online for me to find it. So that's the first one. That's, that's cool. awesome. And so quick question. I've never, I don't believe I've ever owned a platinum medallion. What's the selling, um, selling some selling points for, for, uh, sorry, what are some selling points on these that you would say to somebody who's never owned a platinum? Are there anything, is there anything in particular that you like about them? It does. And I, I don't know the exact term for the, for the photographical, that's not a word device yeah. that goes on with it, but for the 99, at least, it completely grays out the back in a metallic gray. So there's a, but then it keeps the player in color. So you have this player in color with this gray background. And it feels like the player, it almost feels multi dimensional in a way. And then the name, in this case, Willie McGee, or it could be anybody else, right? It could be, I don't know, Ken Griffey or whoever, that has the most color because it, it's almost like a refractor design where it looks like a 3D where if you tilt it, the color really comes out of the name and the team that they play for. But it, the way they make the gray background with the player that's in color, it really pops off. Plus the cardstock is a little bit better as well. Um, and they really focused on the images pretty hard so that um, it, it's almost like they cut out the player, but they didn't. And so they very deliberately used an image of the player where the background is almost very plain. So it really highlights the player doing a certain action um, that highlights the athleticism and doesn't get so caught up in like the background and maybe the way that an essential credential would. And I like and I like those. I've, mm -hmm. I've got one um, of, of another player. But this one really seems to appreciate the athlete more and it combines it with cool card design. Awesome. Awesome. Very well explained. What's the next card you want to touch on here? Sure. The next card is a 1990. This is a mouthful. It's a 1998. <laughs> Bowman Chrome Golden Anniversary Refractor out of five of Brian Jordan. Um, I need, I, whenever I talk about Brian Jordan, who I have, I have more cards of Brian Jordan than anyone, I need to explain who he is because not everybody knows. From about 87 through 91, there were three two sport athletes who really uh, sort of captured everyone's imagination. The first one was Bo Jackson. The second one was Deion Sanders. And the third one was Brian Jordan. He's the one that sort of gets forgotten to time, even though he was had a really good career. Plus, he played for St. Louis, which is why I like him. But he started as a, as a strong safety for the Atlanta Falcons, playing in the same backfield with Deion. Deion was a, was a cornerback, and he was a strong safety. They played together. And Brian Jordan was really, really good. He, he made a Pro Bowl. Uh, at the same time, he was a good baseball player. And in 91, the Cardinals called him up. I believe on the condition that he quit football. They didn't want the Bo Jackson scenario of, of having his hip ripped apart and never really playing again, which was, it was really sad the way Bo Jackson's career essentially ended with the injury against the Bengals. So he had to quit. I believe he had to quit base, had to quit football. And he goes on to have a really great career. Um, really, I shouldn't say that a really good career. Um, First, he's a Pro Bowl NFL player, but then he becomes a one or two time All Star. He plays for 14 seasons, finishes top 20 in the MVP voting three or four times. He'll never be mistaken for a Hall of Famer, but he had a really good career, mostly with St. Louis, but then a good chunk with Atlanta. I think he wins a World Series there. Um, and then finishes a career with a bouncing around for a couple of teams as well. This card, this card itself um, has a story behind it. These cards are considered ghost cards, right? These out of fives from 98, they almost never pop up regardless of who the player is. So I have this list of Brian Jordan cards that I want. I didn't even have this one on the list because I thought it was impossible. Um, there is one that's a non-refractor that is out of 50. Um, but then lo and behold, it pops up and there it is out of five, just one day, just some, just some dealer puts it up with a buy, with a buy it now or best offer. And even though the price was reasonable, I cannot help myself. If, if there's an offer on there, it doesn't matter if the card is already 90% below comps, I will make an offer on it. And so I make an offer. He accepts. And it has to go, it's probably the most expensive Brian Jordan card I have in my collection. It was just over the, the threshold 
that for it to go to authenticity, right? So it goes to the eBay authenticity. And if I could back up real quick here, I'm sorry if I'm being so long winded on this. About two months before I had bought another card that got hung up on authenticity where an eBay actually called me and they said, Hey, we have this card here. We know that you bought it, but we found a we found what we call a pinch in it. I'm like, what's a pinch? It's like a fingernail size gash in the card that the that the seller did not disclose in the photos. Do you still want it? I said, Oh, thanks for calling, but no, I don't. Yep. Well, this time I get an email from eBay, not even a phone call to ask. It just says, This did not pass authentication. We canceled it. It's like, no, 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 I, I need this card. Right. No, I need this. Um, but I couldn't reach them and and so it was just canceled and I was kind of heartbroken, but at the same time, I thought it must've been something. I don't know what it was. And I, instead I went and I bought a concession card, a second card. I was like, well, I'm going to buy this card instead. And I put it on Instagram. I said, I couldn't get the card that I wanted. You know, it was this rare nineties card, but I got this one instead. Everyone's like, Hey, great card, great card. And then, you know, Zen. So, uh, so it was a new, he says, just curious, which card got voided? And we start talking back and forth and I sent him a picture because I had screen capped it from eBay. And he looks at it and he starts saying, I think that probably was authentic. That was probably real because, you know, he understands the serial numbers and how they look. And it's out of five. It's numbered one out of five. And so I thought, what did I miss out on? What what am I missing out on? And so I contacted the seller. I said, hey, if you still have it, I still want this card. Radio silence. Nothing. Oh. And I wait another day. Hey, hey, still like this card if you still have it. Nothing. You know, wait another couple of weeks. No response, no response. And I'm thinking, well, I will never cross this card off my list. I will never get it. And then um, about four months later, I try it one more time saying, hey, I bought this card off you. It got dinged by eBay, but I'd still like it if you if you still have it, would sell it. And he um, writes back within five minutes. It was on a Saturday morning. goes, yeah, I've still got it. I'll put it on eBay as a lot. And if it's a lot, that means they can't authenticate it because oh. it means it's a number of cards. And for the same price we'd agreed to before, it was like done. And it finally arrived. So I finally got it. So that was a hassle and uh, completely worth it. It was worth the effort just to see it in hand because I've not seen this card before or since. And fun fact for you or those listening, maybe you know this already. Um, I inadvertently learned this. I got a PO box just for you know privacy. I had to buy so much online and sell so much. Um, and if you use a PO box as the receiving address, it skips authentication as well. So just a fun fact out there. Okay. So it may even be worth the investment. So if you live in a small town, like I think mine is 40 bucks for the year. I mean, it definitely pays off just in terms of privacy and also, you know, skipping authentication is nice. And then you can still ship it to your home address if you do want to go through authentication, if it's a card that you're worried about and that sort of thing. So that's yeah. good to know. I had no idea. Yeah, no problem. Um, awesome. And then uh, is the third card the one we've kind of heard about? Is that what we're going Yeah, do? I won't dwell on it too much. The third card is the 1948 Leaf Jackie Robinson. It's a PSA 1.5, and it has the PWCC I Appeal sticker on the back. It's the one that I acquired at the National, the one that I sold 92% of my collection for. Beautifully centered. Uh, it does have a, a couple of creases, but none over the face, none over the hat, none over the body in any way. Nothing that is obtrusive in, in any way. So that's the card. That's my. Uh, that's the pride of my collection. What would you say is the most when you're buying this? What was the most important and second most important um, aesthetic for you here? I know like PSA grades, you know, surface obviously. So you could say I guess color maybe is one of them. Corners, edges, you know, that sort of thing. What what to you really mattered when you're buying a card of this caliber? Uh, for me, it's it, it's always centering when it's a vintage card because it just I have to have to being senator and i think it was maddie c who once said you know if you had the mona lisa you wouldn't put it two-thirds of the way through the frame right you want to <laughs> see it centered the way it is and i agree with that but for this card in particular it was the registration there there are copies where you know it's almost like two noses two brims of the hat and it's, it's almost it's like his left eye is bloodshot in some of them so for me it was there's the registration um i don't mind corners at all especially for vintage cards it, it's got some character for it <laughs> as i as i think so as long as the color was vivid enough and the registration was good and it was reasonably centered, that's what I wanted. Awesome. And could you explain the definition of registration? It's a vintage term, I'm guessing, right? So is it something about the alignment of the color? With It the is. It is. So if you, if you think of CMYK, which is the, the main colors of how something's printed, it's it's like you know, black and yellow and some other ones. Um, they have to put the plates together. So if you think about printing plates, 
if the printing mm-hmm. plates don't line up quite the way, quite I'm sorry, quite the way they should, mm-hmm. then it looks like um, almost like the person is in motion a little bit, and where one part of their nose might be, the other part of their nose because it's a different color is off just a, a fraction of a millimeter, but it's noticeable when you look at it a lot. And mm-hmm. so, of course, the technology wasn't in nineteen in the late nineteen forties as it is now, and so it was pretty common, especially for this set for registration to not be what it should be. And uh, but it, it can be good. You just have to find the right copy, and that's what I wanted. Awesome, makes sense. And what's the last card here? Okay, two years before Caitlin Clark arrived on the campus of the University of Iowa, there was what we believe to be the greatest offensive player in Iowa women's basketball history, and her name was Megan Gustafson. She was great. 2,000 points score, just unstoppable in the post. My family and, the, and I enjoyed going to Carver Hawk Arena to watch her play. Um, she was kind of, I don't want to say forgotten because she's still very much appreciated here, but she was very much overshadowed quickly because as soon as she left, COVID happened. And so the world got distracted. And then freshman year uh, of COVID is when Caitlin Clark arrives. And so she then took over all the attention. But... Um, you know, 2020 was the first year that uh, Panini had the WNBA license. And they put out Prism. Uh, Clark, or not Clark, I'm sorry, Gustafson here. And what we're looking at is her 2022 Prism Gold Vinyl One of One. I didn't know that was a thing for Prism. Interesting. Yes. Yeah. So for the first two years of WNBA Prism in 20 and 21, they had this Black Prism was the One of One. Mm-hmm. And then on 22, they switched to the Gold Vinyl. I don't know why. I don't know why they switched. It adds character when you have to, you know, all this, it's different. Every, I just think that's so interesting. Yeah, it's fascinating. But she, even though she was a first round draft pick, Gustafson was, she had trouble sticking. She just wasn't, she was a little bit undersized to play center. Her outside shot wasn't quite there yet. And so she played a handful of games and then wasn't there anymore. And then the next year she played a handful of games and she wasn't there anymore. So she didn't have a card in 2020, even though she was a rookie. And then in 21, she didn't have a card. And finally, in 22, she started to stick. She, her game started to evolve. She got better. Turned out she was a really important backup center and backup four who developed her outside shot and found her place in the league. In fact, this year, she played on the Aces, and she was uh, um, you know, with Asia Wilson and, and others. So 22 was the first year she had a card, and it was the first year any Iowa player had a prism card. Mm-hmm. And so this is the first one-on-one of any Iowa player um, in the WNBA prism set. And, um, the couple lessons here is it means a lot because we saw her play. So there's that emotional connection, certainly. Um, but also, um, the person who had this card had it on eBay for, I want to say a year and a half and never dropped the price. And I tried and I tried <clears throat> and, and they just wouldn't, they wouldn't go for it. And finally I said, would you just take this price? No, this is the lowest that I'll go. I said, I came up a little bit a month later. How about this? No. Okay. And then wait another month. How about this price? No, my price is still whatever this what this floor is. And finally, I thought, I'm going to be really mad if somebody else gets this card. You know, I'm going to be really frustrated. And finally, I just saved up for it and and just bought it at his at not, not at the asking price on eBay, but on what his floor was that we talked about, you know, sort of offline. And I'm really glad I did because at that point, it wasn't that unreasonable and I was just sort of being stubborn about it and, and full of pride. And I was really glad to add it because right now, obviously the Caitlin Clark cards as Panini products are finally releasing they're they're expensive to the point of being absurd. Um, but, but fans of Iowa basketball know who Megan Gustafson is. And one thing that Caitlin Clark can't take away from Gustafson is she can't be first, right? So Megan will always be the first. And I've got what I perceive to be um, her best card. That's amazing. And something that's interesting at WNBA that I didn't know about until this year was um, the fact that, and it logically makes sense, there's less teams, but they're pulling from a similar similar amount of college teams as the, w, as the NBA, right? So you still have all however many universities there are to pull from, but you only have, what is it, 12 teams in WNBA? And going up to 14 and then 16 in a few years. Yeah. Okay. So they only have such a limited amount of teams. So I, what I didn't realize is their NFL or their NFL, their WNBA draft has, right. I think it's two rounds, but there's only, I don't know how many made it the roster this year, maybe six or seven total players drafted overall that even make a roster on day one, which is interesting, but it makes sense because of, you know, how much they're pulling from, but kind of interesting. 
it's it really is it's the most competitive team sport i think in the u.s to make a roster just because of that yeah and i think yeah and i've heard that too where like uh I've heard people say if your kid's good at sports, you do not want them to try to go pro in basketball because it's so incredibly hard. You only have, you know, X number of players per roster, whereas baseball, you have way more football, you have way more. Um, so it's kind of interesting. Exactly. Awesome. So amazing Mount Rushmore. Now we will wrap up again for those of you that don't listen. We do like a fast five at the end. That should be some fun questions for Dave and maybe some thought starters. Um, so first one. Why are there so many dang teachers in the hobby? <laughs> I think it's because we're around kids and problems all day that we need some sort of an escape. Maybe that's it. My right? friend Andrew, who's listening, will relate to what you just said. Yeah, we, we, need, something, we need something that is ours. The cards aren't going to complain back to us, right? And so we can just get away and be in our own heads and unplug for a little bit. And I'm not saying that every other career isn't the same way, but that's just sort of my off-the-cuff answer. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, next question. Uh, magical, whatever, I don't know, some mythical creature offers you to give you another 48 leaf of any player of your choosing, regardless of value. Keynote there. You cannot sell it. You keep it forever. Um, which player would you take if they offered you a pairing with your Jackie? Uh, it'd be Stan Musial. Uh, it'd be Stan Musial. So me growing up in St. Louis, prior to Albert Pujols, Musial was the all-time great St. Louis Cardinal, and now it's down to those two. So I think that'd be a pretty easy get for me. Awesome. Uh, third question. When you did your um, reset button, what, what is a card that stands out as you that was one you did not consider like selling? There's absolutely no way you would sell card X. What card stood out to you when that happened? Sure. It was um, uh, it, it was uh, it was a Bowman now. I must have tops now. It was a Bowman now card from February of this year. It was the game in which Caitlin Clark broke the all-time NCAA women's basketball scoring record. And it's because I have it in a PSA 10. It doesn't matter. It's not that much anyway. Um, but it's a game that I was at and that my I brought my daughter to. And so we got to go to the game. We lucked into some really incredible tickets. We were sitting courtside about 12 rows up. Wow. And so we got to see this incredible moment and to look over at her. And I can still, if I close my eyes, I can still see her jumping up and down and screaming and cheering. And to have the Bowman Now card from that game, I would never consider selling it. And that's a, so that's the shot that we all remember where it's like crazy distance, just launched it. That's the moment. Okay. Yeah, it was it was the logo from the from the left side of, of yep. the three point lane, and she just threw it up. She scored fourteen in the first quarter. Yeah. Like, we kept like, is this going to be the game? Was she going to have a bad game? But she she finished. She got it in the first quarter, essentially, or early second. I forget what. And uh, the crowd goes berserk, and and of course. They've shown the highlight a thousand times since. Yeah. Awesome. So next question I was going to ask would be, if there's any sports moment that you've been to that you would like to relive. Is there an answer besides that one that you comes to mind? Anything that any game you, you could even watch at home, just any memory that really stands out that you'd love to re relive again. Yes. Um, I was at the, what year was it? I was at the 99 PGA championship, which was Tiger Woods second major. Wow. And I think it would be that just, and I think I did appreciate it in the moment, but I would just like to be there again. And we followed him along, which of course half the crowd did. Um, but it was at Medina country club, which is in South Chicago suburbs and just uh, the crowds and the atmosphere. And this was, he was still on his way up. It was still the ascent at this time. His first major was that 97 masters, that legendary one that he won by I think 10 or 14 strokes or whatever it was. But to be out there, and the weather was beautiful. Um, was it Medina? Whatever, whatever country club it was at. Um, to, we followed him around for four days, and just watched the person who became a legend. But I would like to see it one more time, just so I could really remember what it was like to watch peak Tiger Woods. That's awesome. I'm ironically, I'm going golfing for probably the last time today. It's it's in Wisconsin here. It's been like 50, 40 degrees. And today it is now 75 and sunny. I'm like, I am calling right now. I'm going to take an hour off work and go something after this. But that, that sounds like an awesome, um, awesome experience. That would be really cool. All right. And then uh, final question for you. If you could give one piece of advice to a new person in the hobby who's listening, one, you only get to say one, one piece of advice. What would it be? Be patient with yourself when you make mistakes, because 
it is impossible to not make a mistake and it's not the end of the world as long as you are within your budget. Love it. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. Really appreciate it. If anyone's listening, enjoyed this episode, obviously go listen to The Shallow End by Iowa Dave. It's on Spotify. I've seen some episodes on YouTube now as well. Um, and be sure also to reach out to Dave on Instagram and, you know, just bug him. Just send him messages. He loves getting hundreds a day. So, <laughs> Awesome. This has been great. So thanks. Uh, so grateful for having me on. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks, Dave.